Welcome, good afternoon, and good morning, everybody. Um, great to be with you. I'm Lauren Wenzel with the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we're happy to be presenting this webinar today with our colleagues at Protected Seas and uh, sponsored by Octo Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, so I, it's my pleasure to introduce our colleagues from Protected Seas, which I'll do in just a moment, and National Marine Protected Areas Center. But I just want to remind you of the format for these webinars. We're going to hear a presentation, and then we will open up the line for questions. Uh, you know, Q&A and comments are, you know, the best part of these of these exchanges. So we really want to hear from you, and we encourage you to use the question box to provide those comments and questions. Um, and you don't have to wait till the end of the webinar to do that. You can go ahead and put those in as you think about them. So without any further ado, I will start by introducing Deirdre Brannigan. Uh, who supports the Protected Seas team as their communications and community engagement liaison. And Deirdre connects with the MPA practitioners, national and international policymakers, scientists, congressional members, and members of the conservation community who are interested in assessing ocean regulations. And she encourages broad usage of Protected Seas navigator data to inform marine assessments and marine spatial planning. So we'll be hearing from Deirdre. And then we also have Virgil Sutherland with us who is the Director of Protected Seas, and Nini Diorio from the National Marine Protected Area Center. And Deirdre, Virgil, and Nini will all be helping take your questions at the end. So without any further delay, I'm happy to hand it over to you, Deirdre. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, I know our team is absolutely delighted to be here today. And today I'll be talking about the organization and the database that we offer to support better understanding of marine protected areas and um, the planning efforts on a variety of fronts. So Protected Seas started with what was a seemingly very simple question on the part of the asker. And so for those of you on the call today, you can probably lament with me the fact that the question of where the ocean's most protected is so very complex. And it's a very complicated answer. And so that's really the impetus for founding Protected Seas was simply to demystify marine protected area regulations, making it possible to answer questions like, what are the actual conservation measures in place? What type of activities are prohibited? What percentage of the ocean is fully protected uh, legally? And so these layers of regulation and their contribution to conservation can be so very complicated, especially when we think about how multiple use is often the underpinning of ocean management. And MPAs tend to resemble a US model of a national forest more than a national park. And by that, I mean in that resource extraction is often allowed. So, Navigator was created to understand conservation through a very specific regulatory lens. So you might be thinking, well, what is Protected Seas? Um, Protected Seas is a California business, and you know, I think there's been a recognition of some financial limitations within the ocean realm. And so we have heart we have heartfelt gratitude for our donors because it has been become evident to many you know, California high net worth philanthropists that neither um, the government or the traditional nonprofits from the conservation community have as much uh, support as is needed to really understand and document some of these regulatory issues. And so, because there are a number of competing areas of concern that everyone is grappling with. So in that regard, Protected Seas is not an environmental advocacy group of any sort, but really rather simply a purveyor of data. So the next thing that happened in terms of building this Navigator database was hiring a unique skill set and comprised mostly of lawyers, GIS specialists, software developers, and, and others, all bringing diverse background to um, and specialties to this immense effort. And so here, I will pass the baton over to Mimi, who will be talking about our key partnership. Thanks, Deirdre. 
So I'm Mimi Diorio with the NOAA's Marine Protected Area Center. And when we heard that Protect Seas was engaging in this effort to understand place-based management and regulations in U.S. waters, it was a it was an obvious um, connection that the MPA Center wanted to make with them in that since the year 2000, when the MPA Center was established, our mission has really been to capture and curate information on marine protected areas and provide that information in accessible ways to the public to understand patterns and trends of marine protected areas in U.S. waters. And given that proceeds had similar interests, um, it, was a, it was a great collaboration. So we started working together and formed an MOU to collaborate with Protected Seas. Um, and it has been a great relationship where there's a lot of feedback based on the needs that we hear from the MPA community um, and the the legal and GIS expertise that Protected Seas can offer to help us uh, build out a usable and iterative and applied database to help us inform MPA conservation coverage and statistics. Next slide, please. And also given the context of um, the America the Beautiful report and the, the evolving development of the Conservation and Stewardship Atlas to support understanding of conservation trends in the United States and, and towards the 30 by 30 goal of protecting 30% of US lands and waters by 2030. The data, data has really become a, a really critical part and protected seas information is one of the assets that we have that we, were, we will be using to inform um, the understanding of conservation. It lends a lot of information that is now readily available through their data assets to help us inform this first step in understanding conservation trends for 30 by 30. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the protected seas navigator data is really helpful in understanding um, the, the variety of regulations in US waters. I, I wanna focus on the fact that it's, it focuses on the legal aspect of, of what is allowed with respect to extraction in US waters, particularly with respect to living resource extraction. Um, but it's also very flexible. It has a lot of data, a lot of attributes that can be used to understand different kinds of uses. It has the opportunity to be developed out further to look at uses beyond fishing and extract other uh, resource extraction kinds. Um, and I think the key is that flexibility with scale and with questions. So it, it's not, um, I think that the options are limitless with what you can do, given that it is a sound and updated and curated and maintained asset that you can look at local and regional and national and global scale um, conservation questions. Next slide. So back to that other slide, we did publish a paper in marine policy, I think it was a year and a half ago, thank you. Um, called Beyond the Boundaries, which actually is an important point is that while it does look at actually managed areas and what they do, it also can be analyzed um, to look at ocean space and how the cumulative patterns of regulations um, that are uh, that are exist over different ocean places. So I encourage you to check out the paper um, in marine policy. Next slide. So what it is and what it isn't, I think this is a really important um, slide is that um, Oftentimes, it's important to know what the data, what this asset isn't. So I'm going to start there. It is not a data set that's speculative or anecdotal. It's really data driven and regulatory. So it looks at the law and curates that data into a database. It does not have an agenda. So it's really just here's the information as gathered from legal and legal code from state and federal sources. Um, it, it's not to uh, doesn't have a point for conservation or against conservation it's for informing different types of conservation analysis it has many different uses so it's not out there to compete with other data sets it's designed to complement other resources that are available to understand conservation um, it is best available in global regulatory data so um, with that it's best available means it's not perfect right so it's the best that we've got and it's constantly being maintained and updated and curated and it's an iterative and applied and dynamic resource it is not fixed and static um, and it's very transparent you can track the re you can track the information back to the source so they provide links back to the original data that has been summarized into the data set. So it isn't some black box where you don't know where the information came from. So I think that's really relevant, particularly if you're looking at a 
a specific area, you can find the resource links to get you to the actual data that was used to inform the database. And I think with that, I'll turn it back to Deirdre. Thanks, Mimi. So I'll dive in here to the Navigator overview. So Navigator is the only database with this comprehensive ocean regulation information for more than 80% of the planet's MPAs. And like Mimi alluded to, you know, there's a wealth of information related in this database, like marine spatial planning, conservation measures, fishing regs, level of assessments, management plans, and I cannot help but smile when I say this bullet number three is that we have data for over 20,000 MPAs in more than 109 countries, including the US. And this has been done uh, over the last seven years by a dedicated team and it's now available for consumption. And so essentially we discern the answer to the previous questions by understanding the regulations. And we look at various attributes. So again, the image on the left is from that marine policy paper, um, but we do categorize things like um, human use uh, regulations, like no anchor zones, overflight restrictions, speed shipping restrictions with regard to whale safety, special use zones, uh, yada, yada, a number of other things. And one thing I should say is that these attributes are included if they're in the direct regulations or management plans related to a specific site. So this raises a big question, honestly, and many of these attributes are not well documented in management plans, especially if they fall under another agency's jurisdiction. And that could be a point of conversation for thinking about best practices when drafting management plans to ensure that they mention all of the regulations within a boundary versus simply a siloed perspective of just the regulations that that particular agency manages that might be that might be really helpful for everybody so um i was just making some doodles on my notebook the other day and then made it look pretty here on this slide to just give you a quick sketch of you know some of the things that are going into the navigator tool and it is a tool there i know there's many in the toolbox um, I do happen to think of this tool as like the Swiss army knife in the toolbox. Um, and this image even reminds me of it. So we've got 20,000 areas mapped. We have standardized level of fishing protection score. There's sea sketch integration with our partners at UC Santa Barbara, 22 languages, 110 countries. It's in the creative common, commons and there's a summary of regulation. So that just feels like you need a scissor, here it is. You need a tweezer, here it is. So really no one can understand ocean protection without first understanding the suite of ocean regulations. So listen, if this were easy to do, then everyone would have this publicly available data, but the reality is simply that it takes tenacity to find. And while there are other databases out there, you know, sometimes that information contained within is scant. Um, Navigator can really inform a variety of processes. And one thing I'll say is that, you know, it's not uncommon for federal agencies that are charged with managing certain swaths of the ocean to not have this regulatory information easily accessible. And so I think, you know, I love this image here on the left because when I think of the water column, I very much think of a graduated cylinder with, you know, gradients and demarcating different areas. I'm sure that's true for many of you on this call as well. But I love this imagery because it really does highlight how regulations can be so different on the seafloor than they are at the surface or in the mid water column. And it's also important to note that MPAs are not the only form of coastal protection. It's not unusual if you, you know, click on any particular site on a map to have somewhere between six and 20 overlapping areas. And so the, the crux or, or the rub becomes, you know, the regulatory seascape that consists of many different legal instruments layered on top of each other. But the challenge is that often there's not any particular awareness, awareness of these other regulations. So 
um, that's what we're trying to tackle really with this navigator tool because understanding this ocean-based management can be very complex. So again, how do we de demystify this? We distill all of the regulatory information in a way that can be easily digested and then also visually depicted on a map. Things like fishery management areas, EEZs, recreational areas with restrictions, everything you see on bullet number two there. And then we also assign a protected seas level of fishing protection score. So we started with California and then completed the rest of the US. And that process took three years. And we have much more than, than a simple boundary contained in here. Um, so protected seas also works on an international level. And our staff are not content experts. We do welcome constructive assistance. But uh, we were chatting recently with a colleague at King's College in London who was working on MPA issues. And I added this slide for levity because she lovingly calls this the horrendogram. And I know it looks silly, but honestly, it's not wrong. The Irish Sea in this example that she was uh, looking at has 198 designations across 112 MPA sites. So um, just to put a fine point on it here, this image from the left is from the paper we mentioned earlier. And if you think about the US Code of Federal Regulations, the, the fun photo I dropped in there on the bottom right, which spans well past um, the glimpse of that bookshelf. If we think about the area, um, the Farallon Islands offshore, the Golden Gate Bridge in um, California, and we think about sometimes how that seems like, oh, well, that might just be one marine protected area. Well, it's not. You know, there are 10 overlapping managed areas there. And if you were to tease it apart, uh, you could see that, you know, I have the fishing gear restrictions listed and the other restricted activities as well. So I mentioned this all because the navigator tool is very much like an online encyclopedic wealth of information. And like I alluded to earlier, one that is not that doesn't exist anywhere else. So from here, you can really see um, the managed areas and how those effectively encompass the combination of various regulations. OK, so Navigator and the place-based detail. I took a quick screenshot of uh, one of my favorite places here, the Davidson Seamount, again, offshore of California. If you look at the fourth bullet, explore at mpa.protectedseas.net, uh, that's where you can dig into this Navigator data. You can literally click on any place on the globe that we have coverage for, which is 80% thus far and identify all of the allowed and prohibited um, activities. So you can see the suite of, res of restrictions, the area name, the managing authority, and all the other information. And all of that is super conveniently linked directly to the regulations. So this is hard work, you guys, building a data resource with an international scope. And the one thing I should say too, is that we rely solely upon codified legal regulations. And occasionally when necessary, we solicit the help of on the ground research assistants who can unearth uh, cryptic code where that exists. So recently Protected Seas started to alert uh, other federal management agencies about this tool and how it can help inform marine spatial planning. So we submitted a letter to the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries on a proposed, um, well, I'll just say we submitted this letter to make them aware of the regulatory information that we have and frame the data in a way that can be visually depicted. And so that was based on the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, which is an area that is under consideration for being included in the sanctuary portfolio. And that's an area that has special cultural history for native, native tribal communities and also hosts a suite of biologically diverse and sensitive species. So we 
used the Navigator tool and created this infographic that you see here on the left uh, to help inform that process. And what we found was that there are 48 areas of regulation. And our hope is that this unravels the regulatory complexity because we were anticipating that the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries may not have this information at their fingertips. So the Navigator tool is also able to identify what is currently being managed. And if you look on the um, image to the far left there, you'll see the areas in red, probably not any particular surprise. Those are state of California designated marine protected areas. We've got nine other state managed areas and then 24 other federal managed areas, you know, related to essential fish habitat, ground fish conservation areas, gear restrictions, and other things. So we just wanted the agency as they were going through this decision-making process to have this information easily and at their fingertips. And another thing that we anticipated might be helpful information, given that this area does host a suite of biologically diverse and sensitive species, was evaluating, you know, again, the seafloor habitat through a legal regulatory lens and thinking about what does bottom, bottom trawling look like for this proposed area? And so what we found, you can see here, is that bottom trawling is currently prohibited within 64 percent of the proposed area and within the remaining 36 it restricts it meaning there's some restrictions on the use by the duration the season the net size or other issues and so it's this type of data that can inform analysis related to benthic habitat protection so we thought that would be helpful and then as a result of those formal public com comments Protected Seas has been asked to summarize the state and federal protections through a sanctuary-centric lens by various groups who are evaluating 30 by 30. And again, this is another illustrative example of what is possible with the Navigator database. And so when you look here, you'll see obviously that the four California National Marine Sanctuaries cover this area of more than 12,000 square miles, and there are 216 plus areas of regulation within that. We did a similar analysis related to bottom trawling, and that can, as I mentioned, be useful for anyone interested in benthic habitat protections. And we found that uh, bottom trawling is prohibited in 49% of that area and restricted in the remaining 51%. So this may come as a surprise to some, but staff have reviewed the California Department Fish and Wildlife Code and determined that the trawling is restricted rather than prohibited in these areas based upon the exceptions listed in the 2004 Senate Bill number 1459. So again, to put a fine point on it, Navigator is law-based. It's not interpretive or it's not based on interpretation. It's not based on anecdotal information. You know, while it may be true, uh, that there's no bottom trawling currently happening happening there, that's not what the regulations say. And so we are consistent in our approach that we look just solely at the codified legal regulations. Okay, so level of fishing protection, here's how it's defined. Um, there's our scores for all the MPAs and the MMAs in the database, and it's a categorical interpretation of the regs, and that complements the textual summaries. And the links to the regulations are always included. So I'm gonna let you digest this slide while I take a quick sip of water. And you can see that you know, there's a one to five uh, scale here from least restrictive to most restrictive. And this does enable quick protection assessments or comparisons across regions. And so database users can apply any categorical approach. This is ours. This is how we do it. It's robust and it's transparent, but we're always open to constructive feedback as well. So having defined that, when we look again at what are the level of fishing protection scores within this um, four sanctuary-centric area, 
here's what it looks like. So again, highly restricted in the state of California, uh, marine protected areas, moderately restricted, and then the less restrictive is in the green. And this is interesting in, you know, in a lot of ways because honestly, and most people know this, national marine sanctuaries don't regulate fishing. So this is in essence a depiction of other regulations that are happening within those boundaries. Okay, so all of you that are on the call today can log into your favorite MPA and see the comprehensive scope of what is allowed and what is prohibited. On the Navigator database, it facilitates this transparent worldwide analysis of the regulatory framework of our Blue Planet's MPAs. And we're not hiding this data, we want you to use it. It can be really valuable in estimating progress towards the national and the international targets for ocean protection and um, requires you know, the robust, reliable information on our regulations, on the regulations. And again, without this solid understanding of the regulatory baseline as a foundation, it's not possible to assess the conservation measures. And so the Navigator tool is in essence a building block upon which other assessments are also laid. And so I recognize that there are a myriad of groups interested in assessing marine protected areas. And there are abundant sensitivities within the marine um, science and policy realm. But I wanted to just say that, you know, we are happy to collaborate, especially given it took our team, you know, three years to complete the regulatory data for the US. And I did mention before that we have data for the 109 countries, including the US and territories, over 20,000 MPAs. And so we don't get as hung up on um, what, an area, what an area is called, but really what we're looking at is what an area does and characterizing that in a standard way. And so I'll add here that our team was having a quick some quick chats about, well, if there was someone now who wanted to dedicate you know, one full-time employee to this, how long would it take to create the work that's already been done? And so people smarter than me uh, analyzed that and we came up with approximately anywhere from 38 to 42 years to complete what has been done thus far. So um, it's been a heavy lift and we're really wanting people to use it. And again, this is not agenda driven in any way. We're simply using our Silicon Valley roots to solve problems and offer solutions for what are very challenging conservation issues. Okay, so a quick glance here at some of the 30 by 30 efforts nationally. And when I look at this infographic, um, I have musings like, wow, how the heck did the East Coast get more highly protected than the West Coast, especially given California's environmental um, ethos? That was a surprise to me. The other thing that I wonder about is the um, equity or lack thereof of having the bulk of highly protected areas in the Pacific Islands. And it honestly, it makes me clench up a little bit thinking about any anthropogenic incident that could occur you know, um, having that concentrated area. But I am not the decision maker when it comes to 30 by 30. So what I find truly useful is how this database can inform musings like this um, by having the data together. And that I think is both fascinating and insightful. And so we've also looked at 30 by 30 internationally. And here's what you can see for the EU waters. And so how can this best inform policy? And I should say too, you know, our, our megaphone is relatively small. So we're always wanting more help with introductions. And if you're thinking like, oh gosh, you know, I have a colleague in such and such place that might be interested in this data, please let us know. Um, we're happy to work with everyone. So OECMs, other effective conservation measures. 
And again, I realize there's some debate in the community over OECMs, but it's important to note that the spectrum of contribution for these various areas have a conservation benefit. And so, you know, what does that what does that look like and how can that be incorporated? Um, for the US, we have data for over 4,500 areas, including the 1,000 MPAs and the 3,500 fisheries management areas and other conservation areas at both the state and the federal level. So let's talk about uh, assumptions. I think we can all agree on this call that regulations do not equal compliance. And knowing the regs is a first step to understanding this baseline of protection for various activities. And it doesn't tell the more difficult enforcement story. So combining regulations with compliance information would be terrific and is a natural extension of Navigator. We are seeking partners who can provide an enforcement lens and that data. So I've walked what I've walked you through to, <clears throat> today is how the Navigator tool is adept at answering a number of questions. The why, the where, the what, and the how. And I can envision many uses of this database. Things like list that are listed here in the bullet number two uh, for NEPA evaluations for 30 by 30, for creating new MPAs, for sanctuary nominations, other area-based management solutions. And I would also love it if when various agencies are looking at proposing policy changes, as an example, let's say, to vessel traffic lanes or conducting emergency response efforts in an incident command system or boarding vessels for in enforcement purposes. I would love if they too had all of this information at their fingertips so it wasn't being evaluated in you know, a bit of a vacuum. And so the question that I pose for you is that as you think about your own individual wheelhouses, and the direction that you want to move towards, whether our navigator tool can be part of the instrument panel that you use to chart your course. So um, this is open data. It's in the Creative Commons, and we offer this data freely and encourage wide uses. And it has taken many years and an intense effort by staff to create this platform. So when you are using it, in your analysis, in your research papers, your presentations, et cetera. Uh, we do always appreciate those citations. So um, I've been doing a half hour monologue here and I wanted to just say that um, we're so happy to have this opportunity per to present today and very much look forward to your questions. Um, our contact information is here should you wanna just take a quick screenshot and we're always happy to reach out with them and, and answer any of your additional thoughts a little bit later. One thing that I did want to just underline is that Protected Seas, again, it is not an advocacy organization, but rather seeking to accurately document the reality of regulations, both for MPAs and fisheries, and that we want to engage with all stakeholder groups. So, I know that my colleagues Mimi and Virgil, who've been working on this project together for the last seven years, are excited to take any questions. So on that vein, I'll pass it back to Lauren, our moderator, and we can get started on that. Okay, thank you so much, Deirdre. Um, and thanks for that presentation. So I am going to go ahead and jump right into the questions here. Um, there was a question asking for us to send the name of the scientific paper that Mimi mentioned, and so that is in the chat. Um, so please go ahead and check that if you're interested in looking at that paper. Okay, there was a, another question asking, do you include or compare information regarding IUCN categories? So um, yes, we do capture IUCN category uh, as a data field when it's uh, given. Uh, that's one, again, that sort of we don't assign IUCN categories. So again, our, our ability to have that will depend on, like Deirdre alluded to, if the management plan and or regulation did a good job at 
sort of specifying that. I think Mimi, you might be able to speak more as well, particularly for the US data. Sure. So uh, for the US data, the IUCN coding um, for the marine protected areas is done by us at the MPA Center. Um, and so I know that areas that are considered MPAs are listed with an IUCN category or should be. Um, and then if it's not listed, it tends to be that it doesn't meet the definition of um, protected area under IUCN um, or it has yet to be assigned. So that is actually, as far as I recall, that is denoted in the database if it's unknown or if it's yet to be coded or if it does have an IUCN category. Okay, thanks. Um, so another question, uh, and this is from Savina, I hope I'm saying, pronouncing your name correctly, asks, what do you consider as most restricted or no take? Can you define that? Sure, and I will say too, if you go to the Protected Seas website under Navigator, uh, the page that you'll land on actually has the full decision tree, and it's also in our paper on how we assign the five categories, but uh, a no-take or most restricted area in our system is essentially no-take with uh, limited to no exceptions. So uh, the only typically allowed exceptions would be um, things like scientific research with permit or other, again, very sort of de minimis, uh, likely de minimis uh, marine life extraction. If it's more than that, it will typically get coded as a as our level four are sort of highly restrictive. So if it has uh, subsistence or artisanal fishing or uh, hook and line, single hook and line fishing, uh, recreationally, things like that might uh, be a borderline level four case. Thanks, Virgil. So another question uh, from Maximilian Schwartz is, when informing decision makers, does the navigator take social and economic factors into account? Uh, it does not. So again, we've stayed very focused on just what the, the, the regulations and the management plans. Uh, again, we'd be happy to collaborate with other groups that have those social and economic data. We know in you know 30 by 30 a lot of you know a lot of those evaluations do want to incorporate those factors as well as access and other things that are important. Uh, you know that you know we recognize the humans have a you know are important too and not just the fish and uh, we're happy to collaborate on analysis that might try to combine sort of the regulatory factors and the marine life protection with uh, the bigger picture of the socioeconomic. Thanks. Uh, so a couple of questions about um, how is the data, how is the data updated and what is the pipeline for adding information in real time as regulations are updated? Yeah. So we, uh, in areas that have sort of a robust federal uh, regulations system like the United States with the federal register, we, uh, we can set sort of automatic alerts based on changes to regulation or new regulation to sort of review as soon as possible. We definitely rely on partners like the MPA Center to proactively, you know, keep us informed as uh, new proposed areas are coming online and sort of dates of effectiveness so that we can sort of have that data ready whenever possible to go live for new areas. Internationally, it's definitely, uh, a challenge, we do our best, but we really do rely on our user community to sort of help point us to uh, news in their country or their locality, and so we can jump on it and update it. Thanks, Virgil. Um, there was also a question about how this uh, database and tool either is or will be used to complement the US, Northeast, and Mid-Atlantic Mid regional data portals. And there may be other regional data portals. I can take that one. Um, I think that the protected seas is, is one of the ingredients that should be included in, in all of our visualizations and portals that look at ocean and coastal space. Uh, it, it is just a critical layer for understanding the seascape of regulations and I, 
as we mentioned, it, it can be used to inform so many different things. So it, I think it's a complement to existing data. The fact that it's an, a web service that's hosted, that's updated, it's an easy integration into any existing portal and a great visual overlay um, for all the other variables that are considered in these portals and in the, the viewers that accompany them. So it's a quick add and, and for the port portals that don't have it, you know, we can provide the, the link to the web services. I can put those in the chat um, so that folks who are doing the, the spatial data management can integrate uh, those layers. Thanks, Mimi. And along those lines, the other related question from the same person, Susan Faraday, was, um, do we know if this tool is being used in BOEM's offshore power, uh, wind power leasing activities on the East Coast? And I think people are just generally interested in hearing maybe an example or two of how this data are being used. I can say that uh, BOEM, I know that BOEM is aware of the data set and, and, and its utility. I, don't, I can't speak to how it's been used per se. I don't know if there are case studies virtual that you can speak to. Um, again, these are, it's one of the critical layers of any marine spatial planning, whether it's for wind or for aquaculture or for conservation planning. So I think part of the intent of this conversation is to ensure that folks know of these, this resource and its utility and that it can get integrated and we can create case studies. So uh, as Deirdre mentioned, if you're using it, it would be great for us to know how you're using it and if there's ways that we can Im improve it for particular applications. So um, I don't know if, if Virgil, you might have a case study that you can um, refer to. So I can, you know, I can't speak. We do have uh, for wind in particular, uh, we have some researchers at Stanford using the data right now in some of their own wind studies at looking at appropriate siting and potential for the West Coast. Um, so, you know, there's definitely been some interest in the academic community with the data as it uh, reflects the wind. We also, uh, our data was also used in a recent report that the British Ecological Society issued looking at sort of the comprehensive state of marine protection in UK and then more generally their 30 by 30 land and water and the the main contribution there is we did include a lot of the fishing measures that uh, weren't readily available sort of in a centralized database to to do you know some statistics generation for the home waters only so you know they were able you know to cite that you know based on navigators level of fishing protection and regulatory strength you know less than one percent of uk home waters were uh, protected from marine life extraction which suggests you know again from an equity standpoint they have just uh you know they have a long ways to go as well in designing their 30 by 30. And I'll just put a, a fine point on it in that, you know, we've been building this tool for the last several years, and now we're at a nice inflection point to really start promoting, given that it's 80% complete and anticipated to be complete, which is ambitious by the end of the year, um, but well within reach, we're really at the point where we can start letting other federal agencies know that this is out there and encouraging them. We've had a number of conversations with various federal agencies, encouraging them to see if there's a way to um, overcome some of their internal blocks for how um, different data is managed and really start capitalizing on this tool. And on that vein, as it relates to like wind energy, you know, there are others using it. Certainly uh, we've had inquiries from the Washington Post and other reporters who were like, this tool is amazing. Can we please uh, help use this to inform um, what's being proposed. So there are a variety of uses and sometimes difficult to track. But thanks for that question. Okay. Um, we also have a comment from the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries from Sarah Stein, who just said she wanted to clarify to the audience that National Marine Sanctuaries actually do have the authority to regulate fishing through the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. So I think that was maybe a, um, a little confusion in, in, your, um, in your comment, Deirdre someone wanted to just yeah. further clarify. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I'm always trying to be diplomatic with how I unveil that, um, that distinction. But we did have the opportunity to give um, you know, a sneak peek at all of the slides and analysis that we did with the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and their West Coast 
uh, regional office, and so they're aware of that as well. So my apologies for any um, slip up of how I conveyed that. Yeah, and I think uh, we recognize that you know fishing is generally regulated through the Magnuson-Stevens Act, through the Regional Fishery Management Councils with NOAA Fisheries, but but that uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act does have that authority, and in some cases is working you know along parallel lines through that through the uh, National Marine Sanctuaries Act. So thanks. Yeah. And again, yeah. it, I think it highlights the issue that this is complex, right? Um, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why this tool is helpful is because it does help kind of hone in on the specifics of a particular place. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. It is complicated. And actually, along those lines, that leads me to my next question from Ted Elliott, which is, um, and this is uh, uh, asking for your sort of reflections um, based on what you've learned through this process. Is overlapping jurisdiction a problem? Um, or is it a sort of a better legislative practice to have um, a marine protected area um, authority that has wider ranging authority over a, you know, a broader set of activities? Um, so yeah. I think people are interested in that um, and, and maybe in, in seeing if there are countries that take different approaches and maybe have less overlap as a result. Yeah, that's a great question. And I suspect Mimi has some musings on that. But again, just to underline the point is we're not lobbying for any particular outcome. We are saying here is the complexity of the data all at your fingertips and really using it for policymakers and other legislative staff to discern is this the best way to do that? We're, we're sort of remaining silent on that point. But Mimi, did you have other thoughts? You know, with, with 30 by 30 in the dialogue around what are we managing and conserving, I think it's um, a really informative resource to look at opportunities for collaboration and co-management. I don't think we'll change how we do business, and I don't know that, I mean, I think it's a, um, an important point to realize that in some places we have upwards of 20 to 30 overlapping regulatory authorities that separately manage one part of an ecosystem or a species. Um, and just for the information part so that we can improve our co-management. So I don't know that the, the strategies for management will change anytime in the near future, but I do think that this, these data reveal the complexity and the opportunities um, for collaboration. And, and I think that that should be what we, um, if we're lobbying for anything, and if we have a, a you know, um, any point from that, is that it, we have opportunity to work with other agencies um, that may not have the same exact purpose in mind, but the outcomes um, are, are focused on conservation. So uh, I think that's what we can learn at this point. Um, and there's obviously room for improvement for how we, we do that. And I, I would just add for a counter example of a, a, a country that's at least from, again, the, the marine extraction perspective is much more straightforward would be to, to, to look at Mexico and Navigator as uh, a country that, again, for the most part, sort of their fisheries management and MPA management is somewhat uh, aligned. And again, I'm not uh, by any means an expert on the internal politics of how that actually occurs in practice, but just from the simple having mapped it perspective, uh, if you look at sort of Mexico compared to the US, there's quite a bit less overlapping jurisdiction. Thanks, Virgil. Um, there's also a question about um, kind of the quality of spatial information and whether you give advice to agencies and countries on how to improve their spatial data for use in marine spatial planning or, um, or have certain requirements in terms of the quality of spatial data that, that is needed to be included. So our, our process sort of for the spatial data is if we can find an official source for management authority, uh, we will use that unless it's, you know, technically infeasible, I guess I would call it. The, the, the data density, you know, maybe, you know, they're using a one centimeter resolution coastline with 10,000 islands, uh, you know, just some practical limits of spatial databases. Uh, in that case, what we'll generally do is we will put a copy of the full boundary in the data, but we'll make a simplified version that tries to retain, you know, the, the most pertinent landmarks uh, so that it's just practically viewable on a map, on a digital map. Um, 
usually in those cases we will sort of provide feedback and say you know it's great you have this really really overly detailed coastline do you perhaps have a version yourself that's simpler again because we want to make sure that we're not missing some management intent in the decision making of why they went with a particular resolution uh, what we found challenging really since the beginning of the project even in the united states is anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the areas we find in regulation don't have readily available digital boundaries uh, so in those cases our team will actually digitize the boundary from the legal reference when possible and again all of this is attributed in our data so if you look at the boundary source field you will know you know is this management authority boundary and from whom and that it's been unmodified or uh, is it management authority boundary but we've simplified the coastwise components for usability or was it protected seas digitized and you know that's one of the things in our update process you know we give those digital maps back to the management authorities if they'd like to use them or perhaps uh, at least as encouragement to uh, create their own official versions that they can then not only share with us but with you know everyone who needs that data thanks Virgil. there are quite a few lauren, questions about oh, oh go ahead deirdre well lauren i just wanted to add in uh what seems like related but not specific um answer to that question i think you know it's so important as different agencies and others are um, you know, making proposed rulemaking and other things that when we're looking at how the spatial data is conveyed from a communications perspective, I, I feel like if we don't have all of that information in front of us, then we're sort of missing the mark a bit in what the full scope of regulatory information can be in any one place. So I feel like that is really important, you know, to just have that, that comprehensive glance at any particular uh, swath of ocean. Yeah, thank you, Deirdre. I was just going to comment that there were a few questions about the international coverage of protected seas. I think people are really excited about this tool, but also noticing gaps and asking, you know, are there ways to help fill in gaps in um, Australia, New Zealand, Africa? And then also um, mentioning, uh, you know, is there a way to indicate a lack of data rather than no protection? Um, because someone was commenting that in Cuba, you only list one MPA when they have many MPAs, but perhaps there is not readily available data on the others. That's correct. C Cuba particularly, we actually do have all of the spatial data, but we have yet to be able to source regulations for the vast majority. So if someone's listening and could help us with uh, getting access to the actual management plans and regulations for Cuba, we would be very eager to work with you. Um, Australia and New Zealand, uh, look, uh, watch that space, uh, so to speak. Uh, New Zealand is actually in the wrap-up phase of our review, including fisheries, and should publish very soon. Uh, Australia, we're about a third of the way done with that review, and that's one of our major priorities today for the team. Um, Africa, again, if you have good data for some of the African countries you see are missing on our map, please reach out. Uh, you should be able to notice on the map if the EEZ is yellow bordered, that indicates a country that's either in review or not yet started versus countries that have the solid gray uh, exclusive economic zone boundaries on our public map. Those are ones where we've uh, completed the review. And so if you're not seeing an MPA, it either means we couldn't uh, find it or we couldn't verify that it actually had any regulations in place. So again, as a note, we don't include proposed areas. We only include implemented areas with regulations. Um, also note for our international uh, attendees, we do translate the basic regulation info uh, back into official languages as well. So on the public map, there's the little flag icon and you can uh, pick from 22 different languages. And when you pick a language, it will limit the country choices on the map to those countries that have that particular language supported. And I will note that there are a couple of uh, queries about collaboration uh, in Colombia, interested in, in following up with you and also um, a question about 
possibly working together to use the marine gazetteer, marine regions as a source for quality controlled shape files of geographic units, which is fully documented and open source. Yes, we so, do use uh, marine. Uh, we do use marine regions for a lot of our EEZ and and sort of national or state subnational boundary data, and that should be attributed uh, for those areas in our data. Great, and, and I will just note for all those who are listening, um, you know, we do have all of your comments here and we can follow up individually with a couple of you who, who wanted to follow up on specific issues. Um, so getting back to the US, there was a question, um, and I think you, you called this out, Deirdre, of uh, noting that a higher percentage of the East Coast was more highly protected than the West Coast. What criteria go into labeling an area as highly protected? And I know Virgil, you, you spoke to this, but maybe you can just, mentioned the the explanation of the um of you know the, the reasons for that regional data sure so again this map is is strictly using our our regulations based level of fishing protection so it's not again to caveat this you know it's not a comprehensive system looking at you know a broader range of factors uh but we believe it's at least a good first indicator or baseline uh, and in those analyses, a, a site had to score a level four or five in our system, so highly or, or mostly or most restrictive. And again, generally speaking, that means that the, the only extraction that would be allowed and still score in that area is single line uh, non-commercial fishing uh, or single line uh, non-industrial fishing or subsistence or uh, tribal exceptions, generally speaking. And I, I think, you know, without digging into the raw numbers, uh, what the the canyons and seamounts designation basically is, you know, is a very big area in the outer EEZ and that's sort of uh, why it, it got sort of the bump up in, in percentage coverage score versus the West Coast, which is principally protected through a you know, a network of smaller but well-designed MPAs, you know, in California, Washington, and in Oregon. So, um, again, we're not here to argue the merits of specific designations or protections, but, you know, by the numbers, uh, most of the difference is explained by the canyons and seamounts on the East Coast. And uh, does protected seas include any information on enforcement? So we do include sort of contact information on, you know, again, in reviewing all the information about a site, if they specify specific agencies uh, or responsible parties to, re to sort of report problems to enforcement, we do include that contact info. We don't today have direct information in Navigator on sort of like enforcement effort or enforcement activity. You know, I will say one of our partner projects uh, within Pre Protected Seas is our marine monitor, which is actually a coastal radar and AIS vessel monitoring system that collects um, human use data, uh, vessel data in an area, and, and we are using with various enforcement partners. But again, the, you know, given our team, we sort of had to focus uh, on the regulations and we'd love to collaborate if someone has good data on enforcement effort. I just wanted to note that the enforcement topic comes up a lot and it is a significant data, social data gap, um, particularly even just on the approaches to capturing and mapping um, enforcement, but it's definitely just ears open on opportunities for collaboration on how to integrate some sort of metric for enforcement I think would be really helpful, um, particularly for various different marine spatial planning um, initiatives. Great. Well, there have been a few other questions, as I mentioned, and so we may have to get back to some of you individually, but I just wanted to, to note one comment that was made. Um, I can see huge potential to connect to OBIS's Ocean Biodiversity Information Systems, a global biogeographic mapping of species distribution and its European component, your, your OBIS. So uh, sounds like some interest in potentially connecting the regulatory information from protected seas to the biodiversity um, databases. And I don't know um, if any of those conversations have started um, or if you have any comments on that. 
So we, we have been in conversations with groups at Dalhousie University in Canada uh, on that topic, as well as a few others. And again, we're very open to collaborations on doing those types of uh, analyses. Because again, we think, you know, that we'd, we'd love to see like, you know, regulation info tied to what species is this likely to protect and how, and then again, link that to where are, you know, where do these species live? You know, where are the gaps? Where are we doing well? Uh, you know, again, that's something we'd, we'd love to partner with. Great. Well, I just want to thank all of our speakers and panelists for your time. Uh, great discussion, lots of questions. And I want to thank all of you who provided those questions and comments. So um, hopefully you all uh, learned a little bit more about protected seas and we'll have an opportunity to uh, dig into it a little bit more and investigate. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch as this tool continues to evolve. So thanks very much. Thanks, Lauren. It's been a delight to be able to convey this today. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Octo.